So let's continue with chapter 12 in the textbook of uh, Sengel and Kajar, uh, chapter 12 on the fundamentals of thermal radiation. And I'm planning to do with you today chapters 12.1 and 12.2. So let's start with an introduction to radiation. You already in chapter 1 in the textbook of Sengel and Kajar did the equation that can be used for thermal radiation. But let's start by looking at thermal radiation a little bit deeper. What it is and what is its most important characteristics. Okay, we start by looking at an object which is hot. There's a hot object inside a body and the body on the inside is evacuated. So this is the hot object. Here we've got a vacuum, so there's no molecules at all. It's a total vacuum, no molecules, and this wall is at an ambient temperature. <coughs> right, now we know by now that there is radiation from the hot object to the outside walls and with time the temperature will decrease and decrease and decrease until all the heat will be transferred to that of the wall. <coughs> we also know that if we look at the fundamentals of conduction <coughs> that the mechanism of heat transfer couldn't have been with conduction. Okay? It's not possible that it can be with conduction. Why? Because with conduction there should be molecules next to each other and the energy is being transferred by the molecules that collides against each other. And there must also be a thermal conductivity K equals something. Okay. So maybe in this case we can say K is equal to zero because it cannot be any conduction heat transfer. <coughs> in terms of convection, Convection is also the same. If we, if we apply what we know of convection, we again, there should be particles which move around this hot body and transfers the heat from one to the other, then we could have said it is convection. But again, there's no molecules, there's nothing that can actually transfer the heat from the hot object to the lower temperature walls. We also know that in the special case of a Nusselt number equal to 1, that then convection would also be, the mode of convection would be the same as conduction. But the Nusselt number is also equal to the transfer coefficient, a characteristic dimension divided by the thermal conductivity K. And again, this thermal conductivity K doesn't have a value, so things just doesn't work if we try to apply the laws of conduction and the laws of convection to a radiation heat transfer problem. <coughs> okay, so the thing that both of these modes of heat transfer require is a medium. There should be a medium. If there's not a medium, then they cannot work. <coughs> and that is what distinguishes radiation heat transfer from conduction heat transfer and convection heat transfer. With radiation heat transfer, that is our first most important characteristic, is that no medium is required for heat transfer. <coughs> no medium is required for heat transfer. Just look at two two important applications of this. First one is the sun. Here's the sun and here's the earth. Okay. Now the temperature of the sun we're going to consider late, later on, but it is very very high, something like 5700, I cannot remember if it's degrees Celsius or Kelvin, but something like that. And then we look at the Earth, which is in the order of magnitude 
on average temperature maybe 20 degrees Celsius. Okay. In between, what do we have in between? In between, we have temperatures of minus 20 degrees Celsius, just at about approximately 10,000 kilometers from Earth, and temperatures much lower than minus 20. Okay. But the heat is being transferred right through the medium to the Earth. So we do not need a medium in between. So that is one of the important characteristics of radiation heat transfer. <coughs> Another, <coughs> so the medium, <coughs> or if, if there is a medium, can be at a colder temperature than the other two. <coughs> the other very similar application is a fire in winter. Okay. Let's suppose there's a fire. Average fire temperature is about 900 degrees Celsius and you're having a braai outside and here you're standing close to the fire. Okay. Although the inner temperature of your body is about 37, on the surface the temperature would be about 30 degrees Celsius and let's suppose it is a cold winter's night at 5 degrees Celsius. <coughs> As you know, if you, you don't have to be that far away from the fire, but you will heat up. Okay. But the air in between, the air in between will not be at a temperature higher than 30 degrees Celsius. It would remain very, very low. You agree? So we normally, <coughs> normally with conduction and if we, if we would sort of take this problem and apply it to, let's call it the fire, a medium in between and your body. <laughs> so there's the fire and your body. If it was a conduction heat transfer problem, we know that inside the fire, all right, there will be a temperature distribution on the inside. And here's your body. Your body also on the center would have a temperature of about 37 and it would do something like that or let me, let me do it here so that it is approximately on scale. So there on the inside is 37, there is 30. If we would plot the temperature now as a function of x, okay, that's temperature as a function of x, if between you and the fire there was water or another medium, then the temperature distribution would be maybe linear if it is conduction. Okay. If it was convection, it would have do, maybe do something like that, another type of gradient. But in general, the temperature of the medium in between will be at a higher temperature than that of your skin. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been heat transfer. You agree? So that is why we know it is radiation heat transfer and it is not conduction and convection. Okay. Now, in the case of the same case where we now know it is a radiation, we actually now have the following. We have a temperature on the inside in a fire that maybe would be in the order of about 900 degrees Celsius. Temperature in your body about between 37 and 30. And the temperature on the air in between would do something like that. That may be 5 degrees. And the same thing between the sun and the earth. Okay. The sun temperature, very, very high, almost 6,000 Kelvin. The earth temperature, order of magnitude, between 10 to 20 degrees Celsius. And in between temperatures of minus 20 and much, much lower, but it doesn't heat up in between. So the radiation heat transfer occurs without using the medium in between. <coughs> right, so that is the first very important characteristic of thermal radiation. The second one is that 
the radiation would be at its fastest at, the, at its fastest if it's a vacuum. If there's a vacuum as a medium in between, then we know that the radiation heat transfer will occur at the speed of light, which is equal to uh, 3 multiplied by 10 to the 8 meters per second. You know it is 2.999, etc., etc., but about 3 multiplied by 10 to the 8 meters per second. <coughs> we will get to another, other mediums like air, etc., and water. We will get to them a little bit later. But that is the fastest possible speed at which the radiation heat transfer can occur in a vacuum. And it occurs in gases, okay, <laughs> like air, but very surprisingly it also occurs in liquids and in solids. In our previous work, we in general, in general neglected the radiation heat transfer. And you'll see why a little bit later on. But in general, we've neglected it. But radiation heat transfer can also occur inside a solid, inside a liquid. <coughs> right. Now, the theory or the historical work of radiation heat transfer started with Maxwell. Maxwell, who in 1864 postulated that, and you know Maxwell's law, it says that if you accelerate a charge, accelerate it, or if you've got a changing electric current, What happens then? <coughs> then it will generate an electric or a magnetic field. <coughs> generate an electric or a magnetic field. <coughs> so, if you've got one or other very special ele electronic component, or not, a, or, or actually all of them. <coughs> then, and you would change the voltage or on it, and you can and you can um, <coughs> control the current. Okay, and if you would now do that with the current, you would generate an electric field. electric field like that that's as a function of time <coughs> then at the same time you will generate a magnetic field and Aaron, if you can look down zoom in there on the laptop for me uh, my sketch wouldn't be that good but in general perpendicular to this <coughs> we know that we would generate the magnetic field like that. <coughs> Still remember that physics? Okay. Right, and in between, uh, let me just use another color. So let's suppose that is the electric field, okay, like that. Then that distance would be the wavelength, lambda. Do you remember that? The wavelength lambda. <coughs> okay. Now, the frequency, how quickly you change the current or control the current, now would depend, would cause the wave to become shorter or longer in terms of its wavelength. Okay. But what we also now know is that <coughs> Uh, that is the fifth thing that we know about radiation is that these rapidly moving fields 
these moving fields are called <coughs> electromagnetic waves. Electromagnetic waves or electromagnetic radiation. And it actually represents energy which is being transferred. So we can transfer energy with electromagnetic waves. Okay, now, <clears throat> and it was Hertz who actually discovered that the energy is being transferred with waves. Okay, so previously, Maxwell did all this work, but it was Hertz who actually realized that that is how energy is being transferred. And that happened in 1887. So Hertz, 1887. And he then discovered that the energy is tr transported at the speed of light, which is then equal to 2.9979 multiplied by 10 to the 8 meters per second in a vacuum. And the relationship now between all the different waves and the wave lengths can be determined by this very simple equation that you all know, which is that the wavelength is equal to C divided by the frequency. Okay, and C is the speed of the wave in the medium. C is the speed of the wave in the medium. <coughs> Where in general, C would be equal to C0 divided by N, and N is the index of, re of re retraction, and N would be approximately equal to 1 for air and most gases. So for air and most gases, the radiation heat transfer or the energy will be transferred for all practical purposes at 3 multiplied by 10 to the 8 meters per second. <coughs> right, now if we use glass, it would be about 1.5 and for water, about 1.33. Okay, now these are just equations and it's very easy to look at it and do not really that it's very easy that you do not get a good perspective on it. So let's just go and do a few order of magnitude calculations. <coughs> let's suppose I ask you to go and generate an electromagnetic wave for me so that we can transfer energy from point A to point B. Okay. Now, the first thing is you need to decide on the frequency. So the frequency that you're going to change the current up to its maximum by putting a, a voltage on it, putting the voltage on and decreasing it on and off all the time so that the current flows. Okay. Now, at what frequency would you like to do it? What about 60 hertz, which means 60 per second, which is already very, very quick. I mean, our electricity supply is 50 hertz, okay? So let's suppose we would generate, we would want to generate waves at 60 hertz, <coughs> okay? And we want to do it in air. Okay. So air is N equal to one then C is equal to C0 divided by N is equal to 
3 multiplied by 10 to the 8 divided by n. So c is equal to 3 multiplied by 10 to the 8. And now we can calculate the wavelength. The wavelength is now equal to c divided by the frequency. The frequent, the c is equal to 3 multiplied by 10 to the 8. Of course, we're going to do it in air. And we've selected the frequency of 60. Okay, so the wavelength is equal to, going to be equal to 5 multiplied by 10 to the 6 meters. <coughs> what does that mean? 5 multiplied by 10 to the 6 meters. Well, it is about 5,000 kilometers. <coughs> Is that right? How far is 5,000 kilometers? If you now think of the distance between us and Cape Town, 5,000 kilometers, 10,000 is from Cape Town to Egypt. Okay. So if you think of Cape Town to the Ecuador, okay, that is how long it is going to be, 5,000 meters. So I know my sketch is not going to be good, but if that is now Africa, <laughs> Oh my goodness, okay, something like that. <laughs> yes, Cape Town, there's Egypt. <laughs> uh, there's something a warm there, huh? Uh, something like that, right. Okay, so 5,000 kilometers, if we now think of our wave, if we want to start generating it, <clears throat> it's going to take 5,000 meters for one wavelength. So it's a very, very long wave that we're going to generate. You agree? So if we want to make it shorter, we have to increase the frequency. Do you agree? And you'll see later on why I want to make the frequency smaller. Okay. So let's suppose we want to generate, we choose now a frequency of 60 kilohertz, okay, 60,000 hertz, then the wave is starting to become five kilometers. <laughs> so already a very, very long one. And if we select 60 megahertz, then the wave starts becoming five meters. Okay. Five meters. So from here to there at the end, we will sort of get five one wave in. You get it? Just order of magnitude calculations. And again, the reason I'm doing that, if you can just be patient, you will see just now how I'm doing doing that. Right. <coughs> okay, the seventh the seventh characteristic of radiation. Planck in the 1900s, Planck, came up with the idea that energy is actually being transported in particles when this happens. Okay? And it was Planck who then came up with the equation that energy the energy that is being transported by electromagnetic waves is equal to Planck's constant multiplied by the frequency. And from the frequency, we can then calculate H multiplied by C divided by lambda. Okay, where H, Planck's constant, is equal to 662 uh, 6069 multiplied by 10 to the minus 34 joules per second. Okay, very, very small value. Mm. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, joule second. Otherwise, it would be what? Right, two second. Okay. So that is Planck's constant. So 
the energy is being transported as discrete packet packages called photons or quanta. So that is where it came from. And that opened the door for quantum theory in physics. Okay. Right, now, if we look at this equation, what is important to notice from it? <coughs> what is important to notice from it is we now look at the three different cases that we've considered. A frequency of 60 hertz, a frequency of 60 kilohertz, and a frequency of 60 megahertz. If we would now go and calculate E for each one of these three different cases, which is now very easy, we just multiply it by the frequency. And then for this case, it will be equal to uh, 3.98 e to the minus 32 joules. Okay. Because hertz is 1 divided by seconds. Okay. This one would be equal to e to the minus 29. And that one would be equal to e to the minus 26 joules. Okay. For all three cases. So... It's a very simple thing to notice, but what is, the, what is the very important thing that we should take note of? What is the very important thing that we should take note of? And that is that the energy we can transfer more energy at at high frequencies or low wavelengths. So as the wavelength goes down and the frequency goes up And that is what happens with our transfer of energy. Transfer of energy increases with the frequency but decreases with the wavelength. You can see it from there. You agree? Very, very simple. Right, now if we look now on a scale which is sort of called the electromagnetic scale Let me show it to you here on my laptop. Right, and this same scale or graph is given in your textbook. <clears throat> okay. Here we've got on the left okay, we have the wavelength Okay, from, oops, from very low, okay, to very high, and when the wavelengths are very, very high, then we have radio and TV waves, microwaves, and as we go down, we get infrared and thermal radiation, there's the visible, there's ultraviolet, now we go down to X-rays, gamma rays and cosmic rays. Okay. So the wavelength, as the wavelength decreases, becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, there's more and more energy in it. Okay. So nuclear reactors, where are they? Yes, they are there where you get gamma rays. Where's the cosmic rays? What is that? Okay. Cosmic rays, I'll get to that in just a moment. But in general, what is important to notice is that if we look at the energy that is being transferred on the scale of wavelength, okay, then it does something like that. The smaller the wavelength, 
the more energy can be transferred. Okay. So at the moment, the smallest wavelengths that we know of are cosmic waves. And they are of the order of 10 to the minus 9 a micrometer. <coughs> okay. Where do they come from? Well, from outside our solar system. Okay. And they are 40 million times, they are 40 million times more energy than we can at the moment do in our best accelerator or collider. Okay, 40 million times. Fortunately, we don't experience them that much. Okay. Now the, the thing that at the moment can actually give us the highest values of energy that is being transferred with electromagnetic rays is the Large Hadron Collider. Okay. It's the world's largest and most powerful particle collider built by the European Organization for Nuclear Research, CERN, from 1998 to 2008. What are they doing with that thing? The Higgs boson, that is. They build it to, to, to experimentally uh, confirm the existence of that boson. Okay. Uh, more than 10,000 scientists and engineers work together from over 100 countries. Uh, it lies in a tunnel 27 kilometers in, circ circumf in the circumference at a depth of 175 meters between the Franco-Swiss border near Geneva, Switzerland. Okay, so 40 million times more energy in cosmic waves than what we can at this stage generate with this thing. Okay. Okay, so after that is gamma rays. <coughs> gamma rays, they are of the order of magnitude of about 10 to the minus 7 to 10 to the minus 4 micrometers. And yes, we get them in nuclear reactors. Okay. So, in terms of this first wave that we have generated with a wavelength of 5,000 meters, there will absolutely be no energy in it in terms of energy transfer. Okay? So, the shorter the wavelength, the more energy can be transferred. Excuse me. Right, now things can become very complicated in terms of radiation and especially these scales. Okay. Because we're going to refer to many different things with many different wavelengths. Right, now we're going to introduce thermal radiation. Now what is thermal radiation? Thermal radiation is the one that we are going to work with in this course, okay? And its wavelengths are between 0.1 and 100 micrometers. That is thermal radiation. And thermal radiation, the characteristics are exactly the same as on the electromagnetic spectrum, okay? But where previously we used the current to excite some, something so that we can actually generate these waves, it now happens just because something has temperature. <laughs> just because something has a temperature, we get thermal radiation. Okay. So thermal radiation is emitted by everything. Temperatures larger than zero Kelvin. So anything with a temperature larger than zero Kelvin will also have these waves and they would typically occur between 0.1 and 100 micrometers and we call them thermal radiation. So in terms of the scales, this is now where things become very, very complicated. 
I'm going to make it a little bit larger. 0.1 to uh, 100 micrometers. So this is the spectrum of thermal radiation. Okay, and in thermal radiation, there's a part which is known as visible light. Okay. And visible light occurs between 0.3 and uh, 0.76 micrometers. Okay, between 0.3 and 0.76 micrometers. Okay. Here at 0.3, the color that your eye would tell your brain it is, it would be violet. Okay. While at 0.76, it would be red. So your brain would register to you the color red. <clears throat> what is now very important to realize, that is that in terms of thermal radiation, our eyes, that is now our eye, right there, okay, something like that. <laughs> cannot see it. Okay. And on this side of the spectrum, exactly the same. No in terms of the eye cannot be observed. It therefore means that a lot of radiation we cannot observe with our eyes. A part we can see, but most of it we actually cannot see with our eyes. Okay. In many cases you can experience it, the heat, on your skin. Okay, especially, and we're going to look at it just now, when we start heating something up. Okay, if I start heating this up to the color red, okay, and I keep on heating it, then the temperature can keep on increasing it, but at the stage your eye will not be able to distinguish that it is a very hot object. You can go and touch it. Obviously, then you'll realize it is very hot. <laughs> but your eyes are not going to warn you that it is hot. Okay. And it's the same in this, in this lecture venue. Everything has radiation which is being emitted. Where I'm standing here, I've got radiation to all of you. This bench, the radiation, the walls, everything radiates heat. Can we see it? No cannot see it with our eyes, okay? but it's there and it can be measured. Right, now <clears throat> we also know that, I mean, <clears throat> okay, now what makes it now more complicated is that that is thermal radiation and now we also get solar radiation. Okay, so solar radiation works between um, this 0.3 so it starts here, this value here, 0.3, and it goes up to 3. My scale here is obviously is not linear and not good, but that spectrum there is known as solar radiation. So that is the radiation from the sun. And again we can, we can see that there's a huge part that we actually cannot see. Uh, I've made a mistake here. Okay. Okay. Um, the the radiation. Oh, yeah. The colors that we can normally see is between 0.4 and 0.76. Sorry, 0.4 is violet. Okay. And solar radiation goes from 0.3. Okay. Let me just correct this for you. So if this is the scale of 0.4 to 0.76, okay, at 0.4 we have the color of violet, of 0.7 is red. Okay. So this is the visible range for our eyes. Okay. Then 0.3, 
very important, up to three. That is solar radiation. Radiation from the sun. Now there's another part of the spectrum that is important, and that is called infrared radiation. Okay, infrared is the part larger than 0.76. Infrared, and that goes to 100. Okay, so infrared, everything that you cannot see with your eyes, is infrared radiation. So it starts just large just larger than the red end of 0.76, that is where the infrared region starts. Okay, and to make things more clear, I'm going to show you this figure. This one there, which actually helps quite a lot. <coughs> Now here, in this region, smaller than 0.4 and 0.3, it's a very, very important one, and that is called ultraviolet. Ultraviolet radiation. So if we look at the sun, this is the sun, okay. we have this part of the radiation, Remember all different wavelengths, all different wavelengths, and the wavelengths are between um, 0.3 and 3 micrometers. So most of the energy of the sun is in that spectrum. 12% is in this region here, which is the ultraviolet parts, which is very, very bad for us. We use ultraviolet to kill microorganisms and it causes skin, skin cancer. Okay. Now fortunately, if this is now the Earth and that is the Sun, we have on a height of about 10,000 to 20,000 meters, we have the ozone layer. Now the ozone layer traps all the UV rays. Okay, so the UV is being absorbed by the ozone layer, most of it. A very, very small part of the ultraviolet comes get through and it causes skin cancer. So that is the reason why we don't want holes in our ozone layer. And the holes are being caused by certain chemicals Specifically, refrigerants is one of the most important ones, like R12 and um, R11, R12, the freons. Because what they did is they would, <coughs> the chemicals would react with O3 and then open up holes for the ultraviolet to come through. Right. Now I want you to take a good look at this, at this figure because there's really a lot of information in it. Um, if I can get this mouth, I, this mouth, mouse to, to operate. <laughs> okay, Aaron, while you look there on the laptop, I, I will go on, on the screen. Okay. okay, so look at the different types of waves. There you can see waves with a very, very long wavelength. So they are typically radio waves. Okay. Then we get into our microwave ovens and and in there, we heat food. You don't want to put in your hand in there. That's not a good idea. And then you can see the wavelengths start becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. X-rays, gamma rays, there's the ultraviolet. Okay? 
And there's the visible part that we can see. The frequency goes up, higher and higher and higher, if we want to get these waves. The waves start becoming shorter and shorter and shorter. On the temperature, this is a thermometer, you see? <laughs> there you can see. And look at the temperatures on it. There is 1 Kelvin, 100 Kelvin, 10,000 Kelvin, and 10 million Kelvin. So the visible range is there. Could you see? So in that range, we can see the radiation. But if the, radi if the temperatures become much lower, cannot see it anymore, and when it starts coming higher than order of magnitude of about 10,000 degrees Celsius, then you will not be able to see the radiation. But the energy is there, and it is being transferred just like electromagnetic rays. Okay. I think that is what I wanted to say as an introduction on radiation heat transfer. And from now on, we will start getting into more into the engineering part of it. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat>